must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Wyrock, and today I'm actually live at Quinnipiac University with a very special guest, Dr. Russell Woodman. I actually took a continuing education course from Russell a few months ago and was incredibly inspired by his teaching style and his perspective of healthcare and physical therapy. So I'm just going to um, tell you a little bit more about him. He's the uh, professor emeritus of physical therapy at Quinnipiac University, received his undergraduate degree in physical therapy from Ithaca College back in 1966, and his doctorate in physical therapy from Creighton University in 2002. In 1981, a very uh, well-known physician named Dr. Syriax awarded uh, Russ with a full teaching membership in the British Society of Orthopedic Medicine. And in 1996, under the tutorial of another very famous physical therapist, Brian Mulligan, he was accredited as an instructor in the Mulligan Concept Teachers Association. Professor Woodman has authored numerous articles on physical or on orthopedic physical therapy and has taught continuing education courses since 1980. And he continues to practice as a physical therapist at physical therapy and sports medicine centers in New Haven, Connecticut, and physicians PT in West Haven, Connecticut. So thanks, Russ, for joining us today. For our audience who may not be familiar with you, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself, your academic journey, and how it got to where you are today? Well, um, when I graduated physical therapy school, I felt a certain calling to be a teacher. Uh, Observing my teachers in class, I said to myself, I think I can also do that. (laughs) So um, after serving uh, uh, in the the United States Air Force Reserves, I then went to uh, work at Fordham Hospital in the Bronx also known as the castle by the zoo because it's right across the street from the Bronx Zoo. And this hospital was so old that it did not have air conditioning. And during surgery, the windows were open and pigeons would fly around the operating room. Oh that shows gosh. you how far back <laughs> I go. Imagine, imagine that today. And while practicing physical therapy there, I was lucky enough to meet a very well-known physical therapy administrator, Sam Feidelberg, who was kind enough to afford me the opportunity to teach between 1968 and 1970 at Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn. Uh, at, by the end of 1969, I realized that traveling from Yonkers, New York to Brooklyn was not very healthy. <laughs> so I said to Sam, I love teaching here, but what do you think I should do? And he said to me, well, a former teacher of mine named Harold Potts is starting a physical therapy program at a small college in Connecticut called Quinnipiac College. It is not at all hospital-based, so I don't know how well it might do, but why don't you meet Mr. Potts? So I met Mr. Potts in March of um, 1970, and we hit it off beautifully, and a few months later I moved from... um, Yonkers, New York, to uh, Wallingford, and that's why I wound up at Quinnipiac College, which is now, of course, Quinnipiac University. 
Well, I'm glad you didn't have to make that commute from Yonkers to Brooklyn, because <laughs> if there's one thing that I've learned about living in the Northeast now is those commutes can, can actually drive you crazy. Yeah, so it was, it was very tough. <laughs> you know, I've, I totally find your career very fascinating. And then one of the reasons why I asked you to interview you on this podcast is because you have this great perspective on physical therapy education that not a lot of people have. So you were trained by Dr. James Syriax, who is known as the father of orthopedic medicine, which I think is very, very cool. Tell us a little bit about this experience and what made you pursue this opportunity. I w- uh, two of my colleagues, Len Pere and uh, Henry Balavender, both physical therapists, attended one of Dr. Syriax's courses. At this time, I was teaching at Quinnipiac, and he said, Russell, you have to take this course with this Dr. Syriax this stuff looks fantastic. So in the first day of the course, he was doing assessment of the lumbar spine. And during one of the class breaks, I introduced myself to him and I said, Dr. Syriax, you have explained my low back problem beautifully. And he says, well, that's fine. And what is your name? And I, we got to know each other right away. It was a, it was a hit. And what's so beautiful about him, and also Brian Mulligan, who will be speaking about shortly, how approachable and humble these two people are. And that really excited me, how I can learn something that be very valuable to the profession, and that this person can help me go where I want to go. I think that's a really important point. I mean, one of the things that I think is hard for maybe younger physical therapists and younger students to think about as they're going through their career is actually approaching some of these very well-known scientists, physical therapists, physicians. Mm -hmm. That can be very, very intimidating. So the fact that you were able to go up and introduce yourself um, is is really great. Was it the fact that they were so approachable that that made you comfortable approaching them or is it are you just one of those people where you can go up to someone and be like hey i'm russ tell me a little bit I, about yourself i just go up and i meet people i i, <laughs> I have no problem with that at all <laughs> you know you had mentioned uh that you uh, were also trained by brian mulligan who's another pretty famous figure in physical therapy tell us a little bit about this experience and what made okay. you pursue that okay i was teaching one of my courses in the syriax approach and one of the participants came up to me and he said, Russell, have you ever heard of Brian Mulligan? No, I had not. He says, Russell, you ought to buy his book. I think it would fit in perfectly into orthopedic medicine, Syriac's approach. Well, I opened up the book and one of the first techniques I noticed was this mobilization with movement for the acromioclavicular joint. Now, in the Syriac approach, if a person has a chronic sprain of a ligament that becomes adhered down to the underlying bone, in selected cases, the protocol is to do transverse friction massage followed by a manipulation to break the adhesion. And Jimmy used to always say he did not have a manipulation technique for the acromic lavicular joint. Either you injected it or you did the transverse friction massage. And right away in front of me was this technique that perhaps could be integrated into the Syriax approach. And the other thing that interests me in looking at the book is that Brian Mulligan has these techniques called sustained natural epiphyseal glides, which are very gentle mobilization techniques for mechanical derangement of the spine. And one of the Difficulties in the Syriac's approach is that he only taught us manipulation. But there are people, as you know, Stephanie, who are not comfortable being manipulated. So if you can find out the gentle approach to make them feel better, so much the better. And I saw right away how that would be easily integrated into Syriac's approach. So, you know, you've taught both for... Brian Mulligan, and for Dr. Syriax. How did you get those specific gigs? That's a pretty interesting, those are some pretty interesting combinations there. Okay, first of all, Dr. Syriax was a type of person who said, please spread 
the word. I met him in 1981. He was already a bit elderly, and he wanted very much for his work not to die when he would pass. And he emphasized to the audience, please spread the word. So he actually encouraged people like myself to master this work and then to teach it. Now, with Brian Mulligan, uh, was one of my former students, Michael Dufresne, who happened to take his, the Mulligan course a few months before I took it. And Michael approached Brian Mulligan about who I was and what I would like to meet him. And once again, I got lucky that Brian Mulligan and I hit it off very well. And he said, well, if you want to train hard, then perhaps someday you could also teach the Mulligan approach. So did you end up going to, like, taking a sabbatical or doing some type of fellowship program to be able to do those? those? Well, in, as far as Dr. Syriax is concerned, I, I got him at a lucky time in his career. At that time in the late 1970s and the early 1980s, he was coming to America and teaching at various places. So the first place where I studied with him was at a veterans hospital in Philadelphia, then at the University of Rochester, and then at Yale New Haven Hospital. So I was fortunate enough that I did not have to go to England, but rather under his study when he went and taught in these locations, he was kind enough to help me. And Brian Mulligan was sort of the same thing. And at that time, Brian was teaching a lot of courses in the United States, and he was in the process of selecting various physical therapists throughout the world to become teacher competent in the Mulligan approach. So it was a matter of his kindness and my motivation together that made that happen. And I'm assuming that as you were learning these techniques, you tried them out in the clinic, and that's kind of how you ended up mastering Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, a word about that, particularly for those who someday do want to teach their young physical therapist, they want to pursue a career. There's another stroke of luck in that Quinnipiac College, now Quinnipiac University, was their style of... Uh, physical therapy education was such that they encouraged their faculty to also be in the clinic. So I think it's very important to appreciate that if you want to teach, you have to be in an educational situation that allows you to also be in the clinic. I'm 74 years old now. There's no way that I couldn't, could have mastered that material or prevented obsolescence if I was not in the clinic all during my academic career. I never left the clinic. I always did both. So there is this, uh, there's a, a new move in physical therapy for half the faculty members to have terminal degrees mm -hmm. um, and half to, you know, can be clinical thought faculty. Right. What are your thoughts on this specific transition? Okay, well, first of all, I think it's terrific that 50% of the faculty can have a doctor of science degree or something like that, not necessarily a PhD. Uh, for example, on our faculty uh, is this Dr. Jason Myerson, and he got Who a has been on our show, by the way. I know he has, yes, yes, yes. yes. And uh, Jason, for example, went to the Ola, Ola Grinsby Institute, in, I believe that's in California. And what my point being here is that as well as being a dedicated clinician on a postgraduate level, he was able to master that material, which then helped him uh, be more competent as an instructor. Now, the other program that I must mention is Texas Women's University under uh, the guidance of Phil Sizer. This is a beautiful program for those who are interested in orthopedic medicine, uh, its foundation is the work of Syriax, and Phil Sizer and his faculty are masters at presenting the Syriax approach in an updated way. And those interested and perhaps want to teach 
orthopedic physical therapy should seriously consider uh, contacting Phil Sizer at Texas Women's University is another excellent institution. And we'll put those that contact information in our show notes for those of you that are interested. In. So, you know, you mentioned that it's important for um, a, an educator to have some time in the clinic while they're teaching. You know, you've been teaching PT students at Quinnipiac now for over 30 years. What made you decide to transition? I know you still are practicing, but what made you kind of transition into that teaching role versus clinician role? Well... Even when I was at Downstate Medical Center t- teaching, I was also in the clinic. And, and to reiterate, when I was in physical therapy school, graduated in 1966, my observation was that what these teachers were doing in their, in their approach, I could also do. It was a calling. And we know that women who become nuns say they have a calling to do this. I just knew that I could, with study and practice, get in front of the classroom and present material. When I was in college, I was in the drama club and had very small parts in theater, and I was really enjoying being in front of an audience. I think I would have no trouble teaching at Yankee Stadium with $65,000, 65,000 people present. Oh, I can totally relate to that. Man, we should get a course at Yankee Stadium. Wouldn't that be a good be nice? use of the stadium. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, you also teach and continuing education courses for mm-hmm. physical therapists. How did you uh, become involved in this? And uh, do you have a preference between teaching PT students and physical therapists? Okay, well, first off, it was Dr. Syriax who motivated people like myself to teach continuing education courses. But, um, There are some similarities and differences. Okay, similarity number one, and that is you must be an entertainer who draws in the audience. For example, um, there are various television shows, believe it or not, watching some entertainers, they can tell you that you have to draw in the audience, whether it's a continuing education course or a former course at a college. Um, my wife and I were actually discussing this at lunchtime today, and I was telling my wife that two of the TV shows in my earlier days of teaching that actually helped me be a better teacher, believe it or not, one was called Let's Make a Deal, oh. <laughs> which was uh, hosted by Monty Hall. Have you ever seen that show? You know that Monty Hall was a master at drawing in the audience for audience participation. The other show that may be a bit before your time, there was a singing group called Tony Orlando and Dawn. And they had a TV show back in the 1960s. Beautiful singers, one entertainers, and they had a beautiful way of drawing in the audience. If you watch a master comedian or a master entertainer, they know how to draw in the audience. And you must do that with your teaching a continuing education course or a course at a university. The second one point that's a common point, and that is for those who want to teach someday, you have to convince your students or your participants that you want them to succeed. You must not be a, uh, one who's a threat in their mind, but s- somebody who they realize that you are their advocate and you want them to master the material. Now, having said that, there are some differences. When you teach at a university, the group is rather homogenous. You know what each of these students have had so far in the class, so you know what you can present based upon what they already have learned or must learn. Continuing education courses, the group is not homogenous at all. And the background of the students is much different from each other. And therefore, you have to preface your material with a baseline material that makes your material easier to understand. On the aspect of humor, 
You also have to realize when teaching a continuing education course that you have to realize the culture of your audience. For example, I have taught uh, in countries outside of the United States, one of them being South Korea. Wonderful people, dedicated physical therapists. But that culture is a bit more conservative, perhaps, than certain cultures in the United States. So you have to approach it a little bit slower and get a sense from your audience what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. I think that that's a great, those are some great points. I mean, under, knowing your audience and making sure you're teaching to your audience is going to further help draw them in, mm-hmm. number one. And then making sure that you're grabbing your attention. I mean, I I remember back in PT school, a couple of um, my professors, you know, would talk about how they taught all the boring stuff, like biostatistics or research methods. And, you know, being able to maintain a class when you're learning biostatistics is a is probably a lot more difficult than if you're teaching, say, manual therapy. Yes, I would think so, yeah. yes. yes. <laughs> Especially if there's an exam the next day and people mm-hmm. are busy studying for their exam, getting prepared for your test. Have you, um, how have you adopted your teaching styles over the years? Um, I think initially I made the error of being a bit too strict way I was taught in physical therapy school. It was so strict in my mind that upon graduating, when I went into the United States Air Force basic training, I said to myself, there's no way that my drill sergeant can intimidate me because I've been through physical (laughs) therapy school. There's no way... What is he going to do? He's going to flunk me out. (laughs) So initially, my approach was that which I was taught under, and I did get a good education, but I realized gradually that you have to, once again, make the student realize that you're their advocate and that there's a softer way of doing it. And I would say that would be the most major adaptation I made from teaching the way I was taught to teaching the way that I realized material should be taught. I appreciate that flexibility. You know, my husband is a resident right now in pathology at Yale and, uh, you know, he's got a great program, but there's a lot of other physicians that are going through residency right now who maybe don't, their um, attending physicians maybe don't have that attitude. What are your thoughts with medical education, especially residency education in some of these um, physicians maybe treating their residents poorly or calling them out in front of their classmates? I mean, it seems to be kind of the opposite of what we do here in physical therapy. Now, as as far as calling out people in front of the audience, here is part of what I've adapted. When I was in physical therapy school, I had an excellent anatomy teacher but he was somewhat intimidating, and it sounds like what your husband is referring to. Well, this is how I've adapted that. Uh, Going using TV once again as the example. I know if you ever had a chance to watch the TV show Cash Cab. Oh, yes. All right, now in Cash Cab, the person who's driving the cab has a way of asking the questions and making it even to a fun game to the point where the person who's in the back of that cab is allowed to call in somebody from the street to help him, or the person can make a phone call. So here is the way that I've drawn in the student in a less intimidating way. I'll say to the student, for example, tell me the advantages of MRI over radiograph in assessing soft tissue. And I'll then play the cash cab game with them, saying, don't worry, if you can't answer the question, you may call in an expert from the room, or if you want, student, if you have your phone with you, I don't even mind if you call somebody. How do you like that? So I've made it into a game where now the student realizes that if they get it wrong, it's not a big deal. But we can make it into a game where they can express themselves, see what they know without feeling devastated if they don't have the answer. And that's what I've learned from the cash cab. 
that's a that's that's I, I think it's so funny that you've adopted a lot of these teaching methods from TV shows. See, TV is a useful thing. <laughs> you, would, you would never know it, right? It, it depends on what you're looking for. Okay, that's um, that's what I'm looking for. How can these entertainers help me teach better? That's great. Um, <laughs> What about like in clinical teaching? So, you know, a lot of our listeners are clinical instructors. Um, do you have any, you know, you've, we've talked a lot about how to teach in a university setting. We've talked about teaching in a continuing education um, setting. What about when you're teaching one-on-one with a student? Okay, well, right now, uh, physical therapy and sports medicine has afforded me this wonderful opportunity to teach in their clinical residence program. So I've had now two students in this program. And what I found out was that they have uh, not the same background as I do, let's say, for example, in the examination of a particular joint. So what I've been doing with these students is I email to them, for example, the Syriac's approach to the examination of the shoulder. And I let them know in advance when a shoulder patient comes in, together we're going to do this. The second thing I do is this. I have all of the joints uh, Syriax approach on video from our Quinnipiac library. So every week I complement what they've done in the clinic with a uh, DVD that they can take home and then study what I've showed them. Because in time we have allotted, you can only show them so much. I also do the same thing with the Mulligan approach. I have the DVDs from the Mulligan approach. And these are the two approaches that these students in particular want to learn the most. So for those two approaches, it's between email information and audiovisual presentation they borrow from me for a week at a time. I think that's an important point in clinical education is that you're dedicating the time to mentor students or residents. I think that that's maybe a mistake that a lot of physical therapists make is that we get caught up in the clinical environment and being productive and making sure that we're serving our patients, that sometimes we forget that we're training the next generation of physical yes, therapists. We certainly are. Yes. And how can we continue to improve our profession if we're not dedicating the time that we need yes. to help that help that student grow into a competent, critically thinking, problem-solving physical therapist. It's definitely our obligation. There's no doubt about it. We have a lot of um, we have a lot of listeners who are interested in transitioning into more of a teaching versus a clinician role. Mm-hmm. What advice would you have for those interested in doing more teaching in a university or continuing education setting? I think the first thing is that the individual must realize that they have to become known for something specific. When you apply for a position in teaching, I think you have a much better chance of getting a particular position if you can document that you've dedicated yourself to a particular specialty. Secondly, that then will require two uh, endeavors. One would be either with formal postgraduate education and or continuing education courses combined with finding a clinical site that allows you to practice what you are learning is the best way you're going to become particularly proficient in a particular aspect of physical therapy. I think that's great advice. A lot of new graduates come out of school and you know, jump for that first job that they get offered instead of taking the time to really understand the culture of the workplace, making sure that the workplace values their continuing development as a physical therapist and their development in expertise. Yes, the first job should not be where the money is. The first job should be a location that you feel will allow you to work at a pace that will allow you to perform a good assessment and apply those treatment modalities that can truly help your patient and help you master the specialty that you have decided to pursue. So you mustn't work in a place that's so busy that you cannot do that. You will not grow and you will probably become bored. 
that's that's great advice. You know, you've obviously been very ingrained in education throughout your career. What do you think has been the most significant changes to healthcare education as you've continued on through your career path? I think it is the knowledge explosion. I graduated physical therapy school in 1966 with a bachelor's degree. And the foundation that I was given with that degree was certainly fine for the time. Now, in preparation for today, uh, I actually contacted a few of my colleagues at the university who teach um, neurorehabilitation and cardiopulmonary rehabilitation and explained to them, I'll be doing this podcast, can you share with me what your students have to know, ideally, for when they graduate to become a doctor of physical therapy? And I reviewed the educational objectives and goals, and I was overwhelmed how any one of these specialties, such as cardiopulmonary rehab or neuro rehab, that in itself could be a degree. Maybe someday it'll be like that in PT. Maybe you'll become a doctor of physical therapy in cardiopulmonary rehab. The way right now, a person becomes a medical doctor, but specializes, let's say, in internal medicine. Who knows, maybe we're headed that way. So therefore, the knowledge explosion is one thing. The next thing is this, and that is the use of modern technology. And here is a classical example of this. When Quinnipiac started his physical therapy program, Dr. Baird taught our medicine courses. And I said to Dr. Baird, who's a terrific teacher, Dr. Baird, why don't you bring into class radiographs to show the students some of the fractures and such that you teach about? And he said to me, Russell, what do you expect me to do? Carry over my back loads of film? That is silly. It's not practical. Well, now you have a way of, by the computer, getting whatever visual material you need and then putting that in a PowerPoint presentation. So with modern technology, we're able to teach more material in probably less time. So things have gotten much more efficient. Yeah, I can definitely uh, say that as a PT student, when I was going through PT school, I thought that the stuff that we had to know was very overwhelming, and um, especially when I was a first year. And then now as a new professional, being out for three, four years in the clinic, you know, there's still so much to learn, especially now that we have medical journals at our fingertips, and it's always changing. So staying up to date on that, I'm sure, is we we don't have we we can't go to the library and look in the card catalog anymore. We just have to look on the internet, and there's yes. like thousands of papers that we could yes. read every day. Yes, it's beautiful in that, you know, you can do a search through one of the search engines, and you can so easily get wonderful articles. <laughs> I remember being a senior in physical therapy school, and we were taught about. Index Medicus, <laughs> which students today would have no idea what Index Medicus is. But Index Medicus was you would go to the basement of the medical library and you had these huge books uh, printed every year. So if let's say if you wanted to look up fractures, you would pull out the book with the letter F, let's say, and let's say, for example, um, 1966, and you would thumb through page after page after page, finding the key article you want, let's say on clavicle fractures. Well, now you can do a search. You can put in the search there, clavicle fractures and physical therapy, and in an instant, you have almost anything that you need. Well, I even remember in elementary school, like when we would have to look things up in the encyclopedia, <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, just think, or even when we were learning about how to use a card catalog and how everything was indexed in a library. And now I think back, to, I think back to that and how easy it is to just go on PT now through the American Physical Therapy Association and you just type in a few keywords and you get thousands of results. Yeah. So things are improved a lot with technology. Yes. <laughs> You know, we like to finish our uh, podcast with a final question that we ask all of our guests. 
If you could change one aspect of higher education, physical therapy or otherwise, what aspect would you change and how would you change it? Uh, I'm gonna, I thought a lot about this, this question. It was great having these questions in advance. And I'm gonna direct that towards uh, physical therapy, the doctor of physical therapy degree. And this is not so much a change where I'm gonna answer this question, but more about a philosophy, if I may. And that is that we have to say to ourselves that we are graduating people who are called doctors of physical therapy. Now, there is some controversy amongst PTs if when we introduce ourselves in the clinic, should we be calling ourselves Dr. Smith or Dr. Jones? Um, I'm presently, I use a first name basis, but in my mind, I say to myself, this patient is walking into this clinic with, let's say, for example, a shoulder pain. This patient thinks that I know what I'm doing. And this person is relying on me to make an accurate diagnosis and then to develop and implement a program that's gonna help that person's shoulder. I think we have to take very seriously that when that person walks into the clinic, whether it be with a cardiac problem or they've had a stroke or a, a, a painful shoulder or whatever, that that person thinks that th th thinks that we know what we're doing. And we have to take that very seriously. Um, I think our education is going in that direction, but we, might, we, must, we can't emphasize that enough. I think that that's a great point. I mean, there is still, I think, some controversy in our profession in general about making diagnoses. And how should we make diagnoses? Should we be using the um, guide the the guide for PT practice? Should we be using McKinsey? Should we be using Sourman? Should we be using you know you could go on and on listing different diagnostic models, but I mean I think the important fact is that if we are going to be doctors of physical therapy, diagnosis is a very important part of that. But I know that there's also some physical therapists that would disagree with me well, on that point. The thing too. is, you mentioned Sourman's work, which uh, we teach at Quinnipiac, and this woman's work is fantastic. You've mentioned McKenzie. Well, in terms of orthopedics, we must integrate our uh, examination and treatment approach. For example, let's take Simon's work. I know you went to Washington and you're familiar with this woman's wonderful work. Well, for example, at the shoulder, uh, Syriax did not do very much on biomechanic assessment. He, for example, um, taught us how to identify, for example, a supraspinatus tendinopathy, but it did not include a biomechanical assessment. Now, Shirley Salmon's work, let's say at the shoulder girdle, if you can integrate that work in a biomechanical model with Syriax's work being a medical model or for that matter, McKenzie, let's say for the spine, a very effective, gentle approach to treating mechanical derangement. It's all about integrating this work that's going to make us master clinicians. Right. Integration versus uh, isolation. Oh, isolation is no good. No good. Yeah. And I know that with some of these uh, models, uh, a lot of people that practice them probably do more of an isolationist model, but the integration is integration, I think, is key. Yes, so do I. Um, you know, Russ, this has been a great discussion. I'm sure that there's a lot of people who are interested in talking to you more about some of the things that we've talked about. Yeah. What, if, if somebody wants to reach out to you, what's a great way for them to reach you? Probably the best way is my email address. I guess you can supply that. Yep, I can somehow. put it in the show notes. Yep. Okay, and a little saying, if you email me and I haven't responded, it's only because electronically I didn't get the email. Um, I do respond to all of my email. So if I don't, you don't hear from me, it's because somehow electronically I didn't get the message. Uh, I would be very honored to uh, uh, communicate with anybody. And Stephanie, I want to thank you so very much for this opportunity. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Well, thank you, Russ, for coming on the show today. And we'll put his email address in the show notes. Shoot him an email. And thanks again. Very good. That was fun. 
Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today. And we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.